All right, are there any questions? Yeah, any, any questions based on the last chapter? Okay, so today we are moving on to DNA technology, right? Because I think we have acquired uh, enough molecular uh, biology background to start talking about, you know, all the uh, interesting things that you can do with DNA. Right. So in this chapter, we are going to take a look at uh, some of the modern technologies that enable us to create genetic variation in the lab setting, right? What we talked about last time was genetic variation occurring in nature, maybe over millions of years, thousands of years, whatever, okay? But here, I mean, we cannot wait that long, right? In this era, if you're going to see things, you have to be able to, you know, get, get mutations to take place, you know, in, in, in real time, you know, without having to wait indefinitely for it. Uh, now, it is a fact that humans have been unknowingly experimenting with DNA. For example, the crossbreeding between plants, like you do the tall plant, the short one, and then what are the progeny going to be? You know, people have been doing that for a long time, you know. And the beginning of the last century, Mendel actually did uh, the breeding of pea plants, all right? And uh, he didn't know anything about chromosomes and two copies of each chromosome, you know, but he had all that stuff figured out right, okay? Uh, so crossbreeding between plants and that between animals, these are instances of genetic uh, reshuffling. In the early 1970s, that is about 40 years ago, it became possible for the first time to isolate a given piece of DNA out of the many millions of nucleotide pairs in a typical chromosome, right? And this in turn made it possible to create new DNA molecules in the test tube and then introduce them into living organisms, right? So this is referred to as recombinant DNA technology or genetic engineering, right? And you can do all those things right now, right, in the, in the lab. And we can do some of that in our center also, okay? We have the wet lab facilities to do that. Now, there are a number of developments that have, uh, you know, uh, spurred this activity in, in genetic engineering, right? The first among these is the discovery of uh, certain enzymes that are called restriction nucleases which are enzymes that will go and cut up DNA at certain specific, uh, specific nucleotide sequences. So here there are a few examples, two on this page and then another few more on the next one. So f say for example this enzyme HAE3, right? Wherever it sees GGCC, right? It will cut here, okay? G -G Even from the other side if you look at this GGCC, so it's going to produce another cut here, okay? So it will cut it up like this. Then there's uh, this enzyme ECORI, right? So that is going to go and you know, cut between an A and a G, right? So it'll cut it here. Then in the bottom strand, it'll cut between the G and that A, right? And it'll produce two pieces like this. So likewise, there are other enzymes that will cut in a very, and the good thing about these is they will cut in a very predictable fashion, right? It's not like, you can break up DNA using other techniques, but every time you, if you use mechanical shear or something, uh, something like that, sometimes it'll break at one location, sometimes at another, okay? This one, every time you do it, it'll break at the same location, right? And there are many enzymes like that. Yeah, go ahead. What DNA? I didn't understand. No, no, no. But this enzyme will cut it up. So as long as it's in, in the presence of the enzyme, it cannot go, get back. Okay. Enzyme will cut it up. So you've broken DNA up, up into pieces. Yeah. Then here are a few other examples. There is this enzyme ALU1 that will go and cut between G and C, all right? Then this guy will cut between, again, C and G, all right? And at, at particular locations, you know, they look for certain patterns and then cut, okay? And you can, you can see the ones at the top and the bottom, all right? They are what are called palindromes, all right? Because if you read from right to left, it's the same as le reading from left to right. Then there is another one, and there are probably more examples, right? Now, the important thing to note, yeah, we, any questions? Um, so, can we say that it's more likely to uh, cut, uh, cut, in, uh, cut from the DNA that is not in the than others? Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, it is looking for particular sequences, okay, and it will cut at those locations, right? So, restriction nucleases will cut DNA in a very predictable and replicable manner. Unlike mechanical shear, which is going to break up DNA, but there is no way to predict where the breakup is going to occur, right? Uh, furthermore, the fragmentation locations due to mechanical shear will change from one run of the experiment to another, whereas these are going to be cutting exactly at the same location, right, no matter how many times you do the experiment. So that's one development, the discovery of restriction endonucleases, which are enzymes that cut up DNA in a very, very specific manner. The second development, all right, that has helped the cause of DNA technology is this thing called gel electrophoresis, right? 
So if you have double-stranded DNA, right, you can cut it, let's say, with restriction nuclease 1, then cut it with restriction nuclease 2. You'll be getting two different sets of pieces, right? Now you can load these small DNA pieces onto a slab of agarose gel, right? So this is some kind of a gel. You, now DNA is negatively charged because you have the sugar and the phosphate with three negative charges, right? So you subject it to an electric field. This plate is negative, this is positive. So, you know, you're all double E's in here, okay? So if you subject it to an electric field, what is going to happen, right? The negatively charged thing is going to move, right? And it'll move by different amounts depending on its size. The smaller pieces will move the furthest, all right? The larger pieces will, will move a shorter distance, okay? So you can separate out the fragments on the basis of size, okay? So this is another technique that has helped the cause of DNA technology in the last 40 years, all right? So now if, if you take a double-stranded DNA, okay, make many copies of that and then, you know, one, one, one set of copy, copies you just, you know, uh, treat it with restriction nuclease one, another one with two and three and so on. So you'll get, be getting different maps because the, the different uh, nucleases will be cutting them up differently, all right? So if you run gel electrophoresis, you'll be getting different patterns, okay? And you can probably use that to say something about the, 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 the DNA sequence okay not complete not a complete picture but you know some information you'll you'll get by by doing this kind of thing right yeah mm -hmm. well i mean it'll go somewhere okay you're subjecting it to an electric field okay so it, it will it will keep migrating but it'll go at different rates okay i mean the the one which is the smaller pieces of DNA, they will travel the furthest, okay? The larger pieces of DNA, and again, I mean, this experiment, you're not going to do it forever, right? You're going to do it for a certain amount of time, right? Maybe if you do it forever and if there's no resistance and all, it might go to the bottom, right? But you, there is a protocol according to which you will run the experiment, right? And I don't know what that protocol is. The, the, if you go to and talk to people in the biology department, in the animal science and all, they know that. Or even if in our center you tell, Ask like Mike Bittner, you know, what the protocol is. He should be able to tell you, okay? I don't know what the protocol is, all right? But the point here is that the, the negatively charged DNA is going to try to move towards the positively charged plate, and the amount by which it is going to move is going to depend on the size of the DNA uh, pieces, all right? So in gel electrophoresis, fragments of DNA are loaded onto a slab of agarose gel, and don't ask me why agarose gel. That's what they use, okay? It must be having the properties that are needed, right? I, I'm not a biologist. Otherwise, I would be a biologist. You know, I'd be doing both of them, right? Uh, so I'm subjected to an electric field as shown in the figure. Since DNA is negatively charged, the fragments will migrate towards the bottom, and the distance that each fragment travels will be inversely proportional to its size. Now, if one incorporates the radioactive 32 phosphorus isotope, right, of phosphorus in the DNA before electrophoresis, then you'll be able to get the position information also because that radioactive 32 uh, phos uh, phosphorus isotope is going to give out, you know, some uh, particles, right? I mean, it'll radioactively decay and you can capture that on a photographic plate, right? So you can, the DNA fragment positions after electrophoresis could be detected using this technique that is called autoradiography, graphy, okay, which is basically capturing the location on a photographic plate, right? Now, by comparing the sizes of the DNA fragments that are produced from a particular region of DNA, after treatment with different combinations of restriction nucleases. So you can run different experiments, treat with nuclease number one, nuclease number two, and you know, subject the resulting pieces to gel electrophoresis. So you'll get different patterns. So you will get a physical map of the region, could be constructed showing the location of each cutting site. Such a map is known as a restriction map. But this is not going to give you complete information about the DNA sequence, right? It's just a map, right? That's telling you, okay, if you cut it, 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 it gets cut up in, at these locations when you treat with the different nucleases. So how do you go and sequence DNA, okay? So that's what we want to do next, right? And again, I mean, new students that have come here, all right, you should pay attention to this because what Charlie is doing in his lab, Dr. Johnson is doing, that is what is called next generation sequencing, okay? That's a step above this, okay? So, but what are you doing in regular sequencing? So a restriction map, however, doesn't provide the complete sequence information for the entire DNA sequence. To determine the complete DNA sequence of a given DNA strand, one can run a four-lane gel electrophoresis following four separate DNA synthesis reactions as shown in the figure. So a picture is worth a million words, so I'm going to switch to the figure and then we'll just go through this text, okay? 
So the and uh, you know the concept is quite easy to explain. Now, when you have DNA synthesis taking place, right? You uh, the the nucleotides initially will enter the reaction as triphosphate as deoxyribonucleoside triphosphate. If it's A, it'll be A here, and then the five carbon sugar, which is deoxyribose. All right, deoxyribose means at location two prime, the oxygen has gone. Okay, that's how it became deoxyribose. Okay, and then at the five prime location, you basically have this phosphoester bond connected to the three phosphates. All right. Now the way the DNA strand elongates when DNA is formed is that these guys are broken, right, to make the reaction go forward, and then you get the the monophosphate basically uh, tagged in. Okay, and how does the next nucleotide get attached to this? Well, it reacts. The phosphate on the next one is going to come and react with the hydroxyl group here and produce the phosphodiester bond that you need, right? But for that, you need an OH at this location, okay? What happens if you go ahead and, you know, instead of ma making the sugar just deoxyribose, you make it dideoxyribose, all right? So here it's a base, all right? Here, uh, because it's a de it was deoxyribose, so oxygen is gone. At this location also, you take out the oxygen, all right? It's just a hydrogen. So then, I mean, the new molecule cannot come and bind here, right? Right? So that's what is going to be ex exploited. So if, if you're growing a DNA strand and along the way some of these dideoxy molecules get incorporated, then the DNA synthesis will stop, right? It cannot go beyond that, okay? So the procedure is follows. So if you want to uh, come up with chains that are terminating, let's say, at the different A's, okay, in, in the DNA strand, so you're going to run a DNA synthesis reaction Let's say the bottom strand is the one that you're trying to sequence. You need to have some information so, because you, know, you need to get the sequencing started. So you'll have some kind of a primer that is complementary to this region. All right? You attach that and now the DNA synthesis is going to start. All right? So the DNA polymerase is going to go look, look at the strand at the bottom and basically synthesize the, the complementary uh, strand. Okay? Now, what you do is you add uh, a, G, C, T, all these deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates, right? They're needed for driving the reaction. But then you also add, let's say if you're interested in chains terminating at the A locations, you add a small amount of, uh, let's say, A deoxyribonucleoside triphosphate, right? Then what is going to happen is that, you know, it's not going to happen every time, but you'll add it at the right concentration to make sure that that when the DNA synthesis has started, right, it reaches this point, at least in some of the strands, this A gets incorporated, right? This uh, thing that prevents strand extension, that will get incorporated, okay? That's the idea. Now, again, I mean, what's the concentration and all that? I don't know, okay? This is called Sanger sequencing. This is the original method of sequencing, all right? So, so that way, you'll, you'll be able to keep track of all the A's, okay? And I, I'll show you in a minute how you do that. But you want to do G, C, and T also, okay? So you're going to run four separate DNA synthesis reactions, all right? And then run gel electrophoresis in all of them, all right? Let me show you. So this slide is, is going to explain the procedure completely. So the bottom strand is the one that you want to sequence, all right? So you basically start with a label primer, all right? You need the primer because, you know, if you, if you don't know how to start, then you probably will have to do some trial and error and start with the primer, okay? Once you got your primer, right, then, you know, you have four different reactions that are being run. In the first one, you add DNA polymerase, dideoxy adenosine triphosphate, all right, so the A's of the dideoxy type, all right, and then you add, you know, all, all the others like deoxy uh, ATP, deoxy uh, TTP, deoxy CTP, deoxy GTP, right? So those are the normal things that are used for synthesizing a chain. Then what is going to happen is that some of the strands, okay, not on all of them, some of them will terminate at the first day, all right? Some others will terminate at the, at the next day and so on in this lane, okay? Second lane, some of them will terminate at the f first T, some of them at the second T and so on, okay? Again, not all of them, all right? Same thing here. Some of them will terminate at the first C that is synthesized, second C, third C and so on. Some of them will terminate at the first G, some at the second G, third G and so on, okay? Now you go ahead and run gel electrophoresis, okay? Now the piece which is the shortest, okay, which is this one, is going to move the furthest, okay? The next one in line is going to be in, coming from the T channel, all right? 
because that's going to move to the next location. So once you run this electrophoresis, and of course it is assumed that between the four lanes you have the same voltage and all that stuff, you know, so that thing, so that the positioning takes place strictly according to size. So once you've run this, then you have the information. All you have to do is just read off, okay, from, so it's A, then what is it, a T, all right? Then the next one is going to be uh, G and so on, okay? You can get the sequence from here. This is the original sequencing. This is the classical method for DNA sequencing, all right? That's what they did for the human genome, all right? It took 13 years to do it, all right? And $3.8 billion, okay? But it was all paid for by the government, okay? So they sequenced the, the human genome, all right? And uh, even at the end of that, you just got all the letters, okay? You don't know what they do, all right? So that's fertile ground for you guys to work on, okay? Now, what Charlie is doing is something different, okay? Here, see the... If you're sequencing the human genome, you're taking the three billion letters, running it through this procedure, right? And getting these sequences. That's why that explains the 13 years and $3.8 billion. Today, what they do is the approach that they call next generation sequencing. And again, I'm not an expert on that, so I shouldn't be lecturing you on that, but I'll give you the big picture. Right? Many of you are taking Dr. Uh, Peng Yu's class. He will be covering those things, okay? And for the AgriLife students, you need to learn the next generation sequencing because come next semester, you will have to do data analysis uh, from, uh, uh, you, have to, you have to analyze data that is generated by some of the next generation sequencing machines, okay? So you, you will need to, by the end of the semester, by January, February, you will, uh, I mean, if you put in the time, you will uh, know about it. But the big picture is the following. Instead of taking these three billion nucleotides, okay, cut them up into pieces that are like 100 nucleotides long, all right, okay? Then you, uh, now it's, it's like a divide and conquer thing. Now it's much easier to sequence those 100 pieces, right? I mean, I, I mean those uh, pieces that are 100 units long, right? M maybe using this method or something that's derived from here. Now, you're going to do that many, many times, right? You, you cut it once, okay, it'll be along some, uh, some locations. Cut it again, it'll be along some locations, right? So the idea is something like if, if you have an encyclopedia, right? You don't, don't want to read the whole thing, it's going to take too long, right? Run it through a shredder, okay? And then, you know, hopefully the shredder hasn't reduced it to pulp or something, you know, but take the small pieces, right? Maybe you read that, I, I read something else and all that, and, you know, parallel processing. Then you have to assemble that, okay? Here, the disadvantage is it took 13 years, it takes a long time, right? Over there, the problem is you just have bits and pieces, right? And the idea is every run of the experiment is going to be different, right? So there are, uh, you know, commercial software packages that will, you know, take that information and then spit out the sequence for you, all right, with some, but, you know, as engineers or, or people that are interested in computer engineering and all that, you know, you, you, you may have some scope of trying to improve the performance of the assembler or something like that, right, if you're, if you're interested, right. I mean, Charlie himself is not interested in that because, you know, he's in agri-life, okay? he's more interested in plant genomics, all right. So, uh, but I'm just saying that that's, because a lot of time, the, the thing that gets to market the first is not necessarily the best thing, okay? It's probably suboptimal, or right? I mean, there's a lot of uh, rubbish that is going on inside, too, you know? It's just that it's too complex for any one person to know, all right? So this is the, how sequencing is done, using the dye deoxy method. So I'll just run through the, the text, right? And then we'll move on to other stuff. So a restriction map does not provide the complete sequence information for the entire DNA sequence. To determine the complete DNA sequence of a given DNA strand, one can run a four-lane gel electrophoresis following four separate DNA synthesis reactions as shown in the figure. I've already shown it to you. The key idea behind this method is that if during DNA synthesis, a di-deoxyribonucleoside triphosphate is incorporated into the growing DNA strand instead of a deoxyribonucleoside triphosphate, then the three prime end of the DNA chain is chemically blocked, right? And therefore, the chain cannot elongate any further. So if we add DATP, DCTP, DGTP, DTP in excess, and a small amount of DDATP, right, the deoxy one, then some DNA strands that will be complementary to the given strand and terminating at the various A locations will be produced. Based on this, we outline the following procedure to determine the complete nucleotide sequence of a given DNA strand. Right? And again, I explained that using the picture. I'm just running through the steps again. So take the double-stranded DNA strand, Pick one of the two strands as the DNA to be sequenced and use its complementary strand as, as the template, right? Then four different chain terminating di deoxy ribonucleoside triphosphates are used in four separate DNA synthesis reactions on copies of the same single-stranded DNA template. Each reaction which is primed using an oligonucleotide, right? You need a primer, right? Syn which is a synthetic primer 
produces a set of DNA copies that terminate at different points in the sequence. The products of these four reactions are separated by gel electrophoresis in four parallel lanes of an agarose gel. The positions of the DNA fragments in each of the lanes can be used to piece together the sequence of the DNA strand that we were originally interested in. All right. I showed you the procedure. Yeah. You have a question? No, no. Now, another thing that you have to keep in mind is that if you subject double-stranded DNA to high temperatures or high pH, the two strands of DNA can be made to separate, right? And this is referred to as denaturation of the DNA. By slowly cooling the DNA or lowering the pH, the DNA can be made to renature, that is, reform the double helix, right? Uh, the nucleic acid hybridization-based techniques Make use of the complementary base pairing properties of nucleotides. A always pairs with T and G pairs with C. Right? We know that. Now, one application of DNA hybridization is in the prenatal diagnosis of genetic diseases, for instance, sickle cell anemia. So even before the child is born, they can screen for that. Okay. Now, if you're going to examine a single gene in the human genome, then you have to search over 3 billion nucleotides. Right? So that's a big, big task. All right? But if you know the exact region where you're looking for the mutation, all right? then it becomes a lot easier, right? And in, for example, in the case of sickle, sickle cell anemia, they know the exact region where the mutation ta uh, takes place, right? That causes sickle cell anemia. So you can go fishing for that, you know. Yeah, this picture is just showing the denaturation and renaturation of DNA. So it's a double helix, high temperature, high pH. It'll become single standard, but then you cool it slowly or you lower the pH, it will again form the double helix. And it's an extremely stable molecule, and that's the reason why, you know, criminals after committing a crime, you know, they will probably leave some DNA behind, you know, even if they turn to, even if they try to burn the evidence or do whatever, you know, some stuff is, is usually left behind. At least enough for them to get caught, you know, so. So this uh, tremendous specificity of DNA hybridization makes it possible to uh, uh, basically uh, go looking for a single gene even in the human genome in a fairly tractable way. For example, for sickle cell anemia, the exact nucleotide change in the mutant gene is known. Okay? You know that some letter G may be changed to C. Right? I don't remember what the exact change is, but that is known. Right? So for prenatal diagnosis of sickle cell anemia, DNA will be extracted from the fetus, from the fetal cells, and then two DNA probes are used to test fetal DNA. One will correspond to the normal gene sequence in the region of the mutation. The other will correspond to the mutant gene sequence. All right? So you'll create the complementary sequence for each of them. All right? And what is a DNA probe? A DNA probe is a short, single-stranded DNA, an oligonucleotide. An oligonucleotide means a nucleotide which has been ma made artificially all right, in the lab. All right? That is used in hybridization reactions to detect nucleic acid molecules containing a complementary sequence. And many of you may have heard of microarray technology. Even that's also based on nucleic acid hybridization. Okay? The big thing about microarrays, and I will talk about microarrays in more detail uh, after a few lectures, is that in, in the case of microarrays, you want to measure the activity of thousands of genes at the same time. Okay? So it's like, a, it's like a gene chip. Just like you, you have integrated circuits, it's like a gene chip. Instead of looking at one gene at a time, thousands of genes are, the complements of thousands of genes are immobilized on a slide. All right? And then you want to exploit uh, this uh, hybridization uh, uh, related to base pairing, right? To see, uh, you know, where hybridization has taken place and where it hasn't, right? I, I will cover this in detail later when we get to the informatics section. Right? So if you're looking for sickle cell anemia, right? So DNA samples from the fetus are first treated with restriction nucleases and all the resulting DNA fragments are electrophoresced through a gel, right? Well, because you don't want to deal with three billion letters, so you're going to cut it up, right? And then you're going to look at only the piece that is of interest to you. And you're going to separate them out based on size. So gel is then treated with a DNA probe, which detects only the restriction fragment that carries the beta globin gene, because that's the one that is mutated in sickle cell anemia. So using the two DNA probes, one is for normal hemoglobin, all right? The other will be for uh, sickle cell hemoglobin. So using these two DNA probes, it is possible to distinguish whether the fetus contains one, two, or no defective beta globin genes. Right? Because if it contains only one beta globin gene, that's a carrier of sickle cell anemia. Right? 
If it contains none, then there is no sickle cell anemia. If it contains two, then that person is going to have full-blown sickle cell anemia. Right? And the lab procedure that is used to visualize this hybridization is known as sudden blotting. Right? And it involves the following six steps. So if you read papers in these areas, in these bioinformatics genomics areas, you will see all these different kinds of blots because what they typically do is they'll run gel electrophoresis, right? Then they want to capture the position information, right? So they'll put blot, blotting paper, right? And blot the, the DNA onto it, okay? So the, and they have different names. If it's done with proteins, it might be Western blot. If it's done with DNA, it's Southern blot and so on, okay? Uh, now, uh, many of you went for the tour of the lab the other day, right? I mean, did he show you, did Charlie show you there was this machine where he could just, uh, you know, move the electrode and, and get the thing to, to come out, the DNA to come out, right? Maybe you should take one other tour now, okay? Because you, uh, today, you know, th that machine over there is pretty cool because you don't need all the blotting paper and all that, okay? It, it's just like you're moving the DNA, or like you shift the electrode, and you get it onto, on, on, in, into the right slot over there, okay? So you don't need the blotting paper. But anyway, for sudden blotting, the procedure that they use, all right, is as follows. First, you'll cut up double-stranded DNA using restriction nucleases. Then you'll electrophoresis the fragments to separate the fragments by length. Then you put in a sheet of nitrocellulose paper over the gel and separated DNA fragments are transferred to the sheet by blotting. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, the norm normal one. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two beta globin genes means, yeah. Yeah, one is genotype, but it will be a carrier. That person will not have full-blown sickle cell anemia. Because if a person has full-blown sickle cell anemia, all right, they are going to have real trouble because then all their hemoglobin is defective. Hemoglobin is a molecule that is supposed to bind oxygen in the lungs and carry it to the cells for cellular respiration. So if your hemoglobin is not the right shape, right, you cannot pick up oxygen, all right, which means that you will not last very long in the cell. If we have full full blown. But if you're a carrier, you might feel tired because you have half the number of functional hemoglobin. All right, so this uh, stuff is then, then transferred onto this uh, blotting paper, right? So as this occurs, the DNA is denatured. So it becomes single standard, and the single standard DNA fragments adhere firmly to the surface of the nitrocellulose sheet. This nitrocellulose sheet is then carefully peeled off from the gel. And you can see at every step, you know, you're doing all these processes, you might mess up here. So the final result that you get, it might be because you messed up, right? So there is scope for error everywhere. So the nitrocellulose sheet is carefully peeled off from the gel. The sheet containing the bound single-stranded DNA fragments is placed in a sealed plastic bag together with buffer containing a radioactively labeled DNA probe that is specific for the required DNA sequence. So you probably have two probes, one for normal uh, beta globin gene, the other for the uh, sickle cell globin gene. So this will give the probe a chance to hybridize with its complement if the latter is present on the sheet. If it hybridizes with its complement, it will form double-stranded DNA, right? So then you take the sheet out from the bag and you wash it thoroughly so that all the single-stranded stuff will be gone, right? Only the double-stranded DNA molecules will remain, right? And because it's radioactively labeled, you can use autoradiography to, uh, to then, uh, you know, visualize the DNA. So after autoradiography, the DNA that has hybridized to the label probe will show up as bands on the autoradiograph, all right? And you'll be able to see, well, are there two bands corresponding to sickle cell anemia? Are there two bands corresponding to normal hemoglobin? Or is there one band that is corresponding to normal and the other one to, to uh, uh, sickle cell hemoglobin? All right, are there any questions? So next I move on to DNA cloning, all right? So we all talk about cloning, right? I mean, what, what does cloning mean? So DNA cloning has got two possible meanings in biology. The first one is to make many identical copies of a DNA molecule. And the second one is the isolation of a particular stretch of DNA from the rest of the cell's DNA, okay? And it's called cloning because usually the way you will do it is you'll amplify that st stretch of DNA selectively, all right? And that's how you'll isolate it. Right? Uh, what do you mean by amplify? Amplify means make more copies. Like, let's say I, I give you AGCT, right? I give you only one, one strand, okay? You um, do DNA synthesis 10,000 times, okay? So you've got 10,000 strands of DNA. Increase the total amount of DNA, yeah. Now, just as a restriction nuclease can be used to break DNA into smaller fragments, there is an enzyme that is called DNA ligase 
which we encountered earlier in the context of DNA replication. Remember, repairing all those Okazaki fragments, right? The sugar DNA ligase was needed. That same enzyme, right, can be used to join DNA fragments together to produce a recombinant DNA molecule. So since DNA has got the same chemical structure in all organisms, the, at least on this planet, the use of this enzyme allows DNAs from any source to be joined together. You could join, you know, human DNA to mouse DNA or whatever. I, probably it's not going to be anything viable, but you can try, you know. So restriction nucleases and DNA ligase. So restriction nuclease, then you have gel electrophoresis, then you have DNA ligase. All these have played an important role in the development of DNA technology, right? And they play an important role even today, right? Even in Mike Bittner's lab, they're doing all these things, you know, cutting DNA and, and stitching it back and trying all kinds of cool stuff. So restriction nucleases and DNA ligase play an important role in cloning DNA. And the cloning of DNA can be carried out using a bacterial plasmid. And the idea is the following, all right? If there's a stretch of DNA that you want to make many copies of, all right? You can probably put that stretch of DNA, right? Through you, using a bacterial plasmid. Bacterial plasmid is like the, the vector, all right? To basically put it, in, let's say, into an E. coli cell, all right? If you put it into an E. coli cell, E. coli divides very fast, all right? Every time the cell divides, the DNA is going to get replicated. So if you put in some extra DNA into, into a bacterium, that DNA will get replicated every time the bacterium divides. And then later on, you know, you wait for a day, two days, you get a billion copies. Then you can, you know, break the cell and take, all, take the, this DNA out, all right? And, uh, you know, clean it up, like purify it and all that, you know. So that's basically what is involved in, in this kind of cloning using bacteria. So the purified plasmid DNA is, ex so plasmid is a small circular DNA molecule, right? So the purified plasmid DNA is exposed to a restriction nuclease. That's an enzyme that will cut it at a specific location. And the DNA fragment to be cloned is covalently inserted into it using DNA ligase. Okay. So you cut it up and then you stitch the, the particular strand that you are interested in. And this becomes what is called a recombinant DNA molecule. Right? So at universities, if you do research that involves recombinant DNA, it has to go, go, go through other lev uh, levels of approval. Right? So they will uh, flag your proposal, you know, I have had that, you know, like they'll block it because you didn't specify where you're, who's doing that work, because they want to be sure that you're not violating any rules, right? So this recombinant DNA molecule is then introduced into a bacterium, usually E. coli, by transformation. And the bacterium is allowed to grow in the presence of nutrients, where it doubles the number about every 20 minutes, right? After just a day, day more than a billion copies of the plasmid would have been produced. And the bacteria could then be killed. Lice means to split it open, right? And the much smaller uh, plasmid DNA is purified away from the rest of the cell contents, including the large bacterial chromosome. And the DNA fragment can then be recovered again by cutting out using the appropriate restriction nuclease and separating it from the plasmid DNA by gel electrophoresis, okay? So basically, the bacterium is like the factory that is going to really make things a lot faster. So you, you know, package it, put it in there, let it grow, and then... Then you take it out later. So that's one way of doing DNA cloning. Now, human genes can be isolated by DNA cl cloning, right? Like you're interested in a particular gene, you can take that part of the DNA, right? And, you know, put it onto a plasmid vector, right? And, and, and inside E. coli and, and get many, many copy, copies, right? Now, dealing with the unfragmented 3 billion nucleotides of the complete human genome is a daunting task, right? I mean, the numbers itself tell you the story, right? So this could be avoided by breaking up the total genomic DNA into smaller, more manageable pieces to make it easier to work with. So to do so, the total DNA extracted from a tissue sample or a culture of human cells is going to be cut up into a set of DNA fragments by restriction nuclease treatment. And each fragment is then cloned using bacterial plasmids as we just discussed, right? So you basically will put it into a plasmid and then stick it into E. coli, let the E. coli grow, right? Now, the collection of these cloned DNA fragments thus obtained is known as a DNA library, right? This is also terminology that you'll hear uh, quite frequently, right? In this case, this library is called a genomic library because the DNA fragments are derived directly from the chromosomal DNA, right? Because you, uh, there is another kind of library that is called the cDNA or complementary DNA library that I'll get to in a few minutes. But this is called the genomic library because you've just taken the DNA from the organism and cut it up, right, into, into pieces, all right? And then... Let each piece be taken up by a plasmid, right? Put it in a plasmid, and then make sure that, you know, inside one bacterium you have only one plasmid, right? No more than one. So again, I mean, there are protocols that have to be followed to make sure that, you know, you're not mixing things up, right? The individual pieces, so no more than one piece, 
gets onto one plasmid, right? And no more than one plasmid gets gets into one uh, E. coli bacterium. So while producing genomic, the genomic library, one must make sure that each colony of E. coli produces clones of only one DNA fragment, right? And this could be done by carrying out the entire procedure under the following favorable conditions. And again, the biologists would need to know what these conditions are, okay? And they have them worked out, all right? So DNA fragments are inserted into plasmid vectors under conditions which favor the insertion of only one DNA fragment for each plasmid molecule. Then these recombinant plasmids are mixed with a culture of E. coli at a concentration, which will ensure that no more than one plasmid is going to get into each bacterium, right? Now, a natural question that comes up is, you have this library, okay, you've cut this thing up into pieces, and then you've cloned them, and you, you have this huge library, okay, how do you go and find out, like, it's like finding books in the library, if there's no catalog, okay, how are you going, it might be the biggest library in the world, okay, but you don't even know where to look, right, so how do you go and find the gene that you're interested in? Now, one thing about DNA is that if you have the complementary sequence, right, you can use that as a probe, okay, and, you know, probe all these colonies and to figure out which one contains the gene that you're interested in, okay. So if the sequence of the complementary DNA is known, one could make a probe and use it to identify the particular gene by exploiting the properties of nucleic acid hybridization. If on the other hand, the sequence of the gene is not known, right, you don't know the, the sequence of the gene that you're uh, looking for, right, you can use protein sequencing to identify a few of the amino acids coded by the gene, right, like if you can take the corresponding protein, right, then cut off the amino, uh, amino acids one by one, then you know, you know from the genetic code, you know, what, what that should be, right? So take a few of them, build a probe, right? But then you will pick up the entire gene because, you know, some part will be matching, you'll pick up the entire gene or, or that cut portion you'll pick up, not the entire gene, the entire DNA fragment, right? You'll pick, or, or if you're looking for that, uh, the gene that codes for this protein, even if you have a portion of this, you can go looking for it, you picked up that DNA sequence and now, you can go and apply the genetic code and figure out the amino acid sequence of the protein, right? So if, on the other hand, the sequence of the gene is not known, one can use protein sequencing to identify a few of the amino acids coded by the gene, right? Now, by using the genetic code in reverse, the DNA sequences which code for these amino acid sequences can be deduced, and you can produce a suitable DNA probe synthetically. So using this probe, those rare bacterial clones that contain human DNA that is complementary to the probe, can be identified by exploiting the properties of DNA hybridization. And it is possible that for a given gene, several clones may be identified because you've cut it up into pieces. You never said that one gene is one in one piece, okay? One gene might be spread across many pieces, right? So as no single clone might contain the entire gene. And this is especially true for long DNA sequences having lots of introns. Now, for many applications, so that was the genomic library, where you just take the DNA, cut it up, and then you make a library out of that, okay? Put, put that in, in the plasmid, stick it into E. coli, make many copies, and you got your library. Then, you know, you figure out ways of trying to catalog the library. Now, for many applications of DNA technology, it is advantageous to obtain a clone which contains only the coding sequence of a gene. That is a clone that lacks the intron, intron DNA, right? And it is a relatively simple matter to isolate a gene free of all its introns. How? Because if it's a eukaryotic cell, right? Uh, you know the messenger RNA is all the introns are, are taken out, right? So it's only the exons, right? So for this purpose, a different type of library, which is called a complementary DNA or a cDNA library is used. The creation of a complementary DNA library involves the following steps. First, you're going to start from the messenger RNA. So starting from the messenger RNA that is expressed in a particular tissue. Again, express means the corresponding DNA is being copied into RNA, right? Messenger RNA. So expressed in a particular tissue or cell culture, construct the complementary DNA or cDNA using reverse transcriptase. Okay, reverse transcriptase is going to reverse transcription. So it will look at the RNA and figure out what, what DNA it came from, right? So, there, so now you got the complementary DNA. Then you will degrade the messenger RNA copy because once you have the complementary DNA, you don't need that RNA anymore. You'll degrade the messenger RNA copy using an alkali, which is basically a base, another word for a base, and use a single-stranded uh, complementary DNA left over. With a single-stranded uh, com complementary DNA, you can use DNA polymerase, all right? And to pr you'll get a double-stranded complementary DNA of the original mRNA that you had. And then, now you have, it's just that the DNA has come from the messenger RNA, okay? But it's just like any other DNA, right? So now you can cut it up into pieces with, uh, by treat uh, treatment with restriction 
nucleases, all right? Then you can stick it into plasmids, put it into bacteria, let them grow, all right? Same procedure as before, but this is now going to be not a genomic library, but a cDNA library, all right? And these are commercially available. Like if somebody wants to get the cDNA library for, you know, uh, let's say, yeah, you know, pancreas or something, they, they can get it, okay? I mean, all, that stuff, there are companies that will sell you that stuff. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, I wonder what is the use of the library? L uh, library? See, like, uh, you, uh, we haven't gotten to that as yet, but if you're doing microarrays and all that, okay, you would want to immobilize the complement of a particular gene, okay? So you will you will buy it from those guys and use it from there. Okay. So based on our discussion so far, we can highlight the following main differences between DNA clones and cDNA or complementary DNA clones. Genomic clones represent a random sample of all of the DNA sequences found in an organism's genome, while cDNA clones contain fragments of only those genes which have been transcribed into messenger RNA in the tissue from which the RNA came. Right? So since cells of different tissues produce distinct sets of RNA molecules, a different cDNA library will be obtained for each type of tissue. Whereas for the genomic library, it will be the same, right? Because it's the same genes that you have across all cells of the organism. Now, genomic clones from eukaryotes, they contain large amounts of repetitive DNA sequences, right? Introns, gene regulatory regions, and spacer DNA, okay? What some people refer to as like junk DNA and all that stuff. In addition to protein coding sequences, while cDNA clones will contain only coding sequences. So these are pretty good because you can actually... See, if, you, if you're going to produce a human protein, right, let's say in bacterial cell or a yeast cell, right, then uh, the bacterial cell or the yeast cell doesn't have the capability to take out introns, right, after, after transcription, right. It cannot produce messenger RNA. So it would be nice to give this, you know, uh, some sequence with, without the introns, right, so the bacterial cell can also produce the protein, right, that you're interested in. So thus, cDNA clones are particularly well suited for, number one, deducing the amino acid sequence of a protein from the DNA. Because all the non-coding stuff has been taken out, all right? So if you look at the, the cDNA clone, the, the sequence over there, you know, you can take every triplet will code for an amino acid. So you'd be able to figure out the amino acid sequence of the protein of interest. And the other application for which cDNA clones are very useful is for producing the protein in bulk by expressing the clone gene in a bacterial or yeast cell, right? And this is better, like, let's say if you're, you know, uh, if you're uh, trying to produce insulin for diabetics, all right? Now, if you're going to do that in animals and all that, you run the risk of, uh, you know, picking up, let's say if that animal has AIDS or something like that, you know, the person who uses the, that, uh, who takes that insulin shot will probably get AIDS, all right? But if, if you do it just in bacteria, right, then, uh, I mean, uh, you, you can eliminate some of those risks. Now, we know that hybridization allows even distinctly related genes to be identified. Like, DNA can base pair even when there is not a perfect match, right? So, hybridization can be carried out under conditions that allow even an imperfect match between a DNA probe and its corresponding DNA to form a stable double helix, right? It's not very strong, but, but it's still stable enough. And this can be used to identify closely related genes using a single DNA probe or even use a DNA probe for one species to identify the corresponding gene for another species. For example, let's say you've sequenced the human genome, right? You know what the beta globin gene looks like, right? And you're looking for the beta globin gene, right? In the case of, let's say, mice, all right? You can use the human gene, right, as a probe, right? Because of the compli large parts of it will be complementary, so you'll be able to pick it up. So you can cut down on the discovery time. Now, another technique that is used to amplify DNA, right, again, it gets, gets back to your question, is what is called polymerase chain reaction, right? Polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, is a synthetic procedure that can be used to selectively replicate a given nucleotide sequence quite rapidly and in large amounts from any DNA that contains it. Each cycle of the PCR reaction consists of three steps, as shown in the figure. And again, let me explain from the figure first. All right. So in step number one, right, you have this double standard DNA, you heat it up, you, you separate it out into two single strands. Now, the region you're interested in amplifying is the one bracketed by these two primers, the green one and the red one, right? 
So you bracket these two, so apply the pri primers over here, and now you apply DNA polymerase and uh, deoxy adenosine triphosphate and so on, okay? Nucleoside triphosphate. So then DNA synthesis will start from here, it will continue, all right? All the way un until, until this uh, region. So the bracketed region is going to get, get amplified, all right? By a factor of two in one shot. You need more of the DNA, you just do the same thing. Again, apply heat to this guy, separate it out, all right? Put the primers and, and, and run DNA polymerase. Do it many times. So every time you're amplifying by a factor of two, if you do it 40 times, it's two to the power of 40, all right? This is how they amplify DNA. Like if a criminal, all right? When the criminal commits a crime, all right? Take this from me, okay? They don't shave off their head and drop lots of hair for you, you know, so that you can go and catch them, all right? Maybe you'll just get one strand of hair, okay? There's not enough DNA to run all these procedures. So they will take that, all right? They'll take that and then they will go and amplify the DNA, all right? Extract the DNA and amplify it many times. Now the risk is that and that's where the lawyers make their money. If there's some contamination or something, even that will also get amplified. All right. But we will talk in more detail about how criminals can be nailed down using, uh, using this uh, PCR. All right. So if you, if you do, do it a number of times, you will, so first cycle, you just get two. You double the DNA in the second cycle. It will be two to the power of two third cycle to the power of three and so on, you know, and pretty quickly you have a significant amount of DNA for running uh, the other procedures that you're interested in, right? So let me just go through this text, all right? So polymerase chain reaction or PCR is a synthetic procedure uh, that can be used to selectively rep replicate a given nucleotide sequence quite rapidly and in large amounts from any DNA that contains it. Each cycle of the PCR reaction consists of three steps as I showed you in the figure. In the first step, heat is applied to separate out the two strands. In the second step, the primers are hybridized. In the third step, DNA polymerase and deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates are added so that DNA complementary to each of the two strands and originating at the two primers can be synthesized. So in one cycle of PCR, the quantity of DNA is doubled. And that is the DNA amplification, right? Now, if additional amplification is necessary, then the procedure can be repeated over and over again. In N cycles of PCR, the DNA would have been amplified by a factor of 2 to the power of n, right? And in each cycle of the PCR reaction, to separate out the two DNA strands, you're applying heat, right? So if you use ordinary DNA polymerase, that would get destroyed. So what they use is DNA polymerase that is extracted from thermophilic bacteria. These bacteria are heat-loving bacteria. They live in the vents of volcanoes, right? That's where they like to stay, so that, that's not going to be destroyed by heat. So if you don't do that, you would have to add new D D DNA polymerase every time uh, you're running a new cycle of the PCR reaction. So we now next describe some common applications of PCR. Now PCR can be used to clone directly a particular DNA fragment, right? You can make many copies of the DNA fragment. The main advantage of this procedure is that it does not require any cell culturing. You don't have to go and put it inside E. coli, okay? E. coli means there's cell culturing involved, right? Now PCR can be used to detect viral infection at very early stages. Here, short sequences which are complementary to the viral genome are used as the primers, and following many cycles of amplification, the presence or absence of even a single copy of a viral genome in a sample of blood can be ascertained. Once the amplification has been carried out using PCR, the virus detection could be done using gel electrophoresis, right? because you can see where the location where the strand migrates. And the schematic diagram for the entire procedure in the case of the HIV virus is shown in the next figure, right? And let me go to the figure. So you take the blood sample from the infected person, then you remove the cells by centrifugation because you have to get the cell then get to the RNA, right? Then you got the RNA. There is a rare HIV particle in the serum of the infected person. So this is the RNA inside. So you can extract the viral RNA, right, from here. So you got the RNA strand by using a combination of all those procedures that I described in Chapter 4, right? I mean, that's stuff the biologists will do, so I, we don't need to know that in that much detail, okay? So then from the RNA, you are going to use reverse transcriptase, all right? So you'll get the complementary DNA, all right? Then use DNA polymerase, you'll get double-stranded DNA. Then, but now it's too little of DNA, okay? So you amplify it. Use PCR, run it many times, you got amplification. When, when you have enough of DNA to run gel electrophoresis, you can go and run gel electrophoresis, and then the location of this, you know, where it migrates, okay? Versus, if you apply the same procedure to blood from a non-infected person, right? You'll compare the two because you, you just want to get rid of any confounding factors, okay? So you have to always run a control group, right? 
And then that can be used to figure out whether you have uh, uh, this uh, viral RNA in that person's blood or not. Okay. So long before that person shows any symptoms of AIDS. Now PCR has got great potential in forensic medicine also, used to track down the perpetrator of a crime. The DNA sequences which create the variability used in this type of analysis, it contains runs of short repeated sequences such as GT, 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 right, which are found in various positions in the human genome, right. And the number of repeats in the population is highly variable. It varies from 4 to 40. Like I might be having 5 at a particular location, you probably have 39, okay. So, so a run of repeated nucleotides of this type is commonly referred to as VNTR, a variable number of tandem repeat sequence. Now, because of the variability in these sequences, each individual will usually inherit a different variant of each VNTR locus from their mother and from their father, okay? Because we have two copies of every gene, okay? So each VNTR loci, we are going to have two different, uh, on two different genes, all right? And there will be different number of repeats, okay? Depending on what you got from your mom and from your dad, okay? So two unrelated individuals will therefore not usually contain the same pair of sequences, all right? And this can be used to track down a uh, criminal in a, the suspect in a criminal inve investigation, right? So a PCR reaction using primers, which bracket the VNTR locus, produces a pair of ba bands of amplified DNA from each individual, one ba band representing the maternal variant and the other representing the paternal variant, right? And I think, let me stop here for today because this stuff is quite interesting, all right? We'll just continue from here next time, okay? But the whole idea is that there are different number of repeats, okay, at these VNTR loci, all right? So we'll, we'll go and selectively amplify the DNA in there, okay? And then run gel electrophoresis, okay? And then see whether the bands match up from the suspect and from what you collect from the crime scene. If they don't match up, right? That means that person, uh, you know, can, can be eliminated from the list of suspects, all right? But if they do match up, doesn't mean for sure that that person committed it. And, and that's again fertile ground for the lawyers because they can calculate the probability that this guy committed the crime and then they'll argue back and forth, you know? So I will talk more about this next time.